Alara stepped into Sieglint, a coastal village nestled in a world where magical beasts roamed and magic whispered in the wind. It was a stark contrast to the thriving metropolis of Thranis she had left behind. As she wandered the narrow lanes, she took in the quaint cottages with their thatched roofs, so different from the towering buildings she was used to. The bustling marketplace was a cacophony of new sounds, filled with the chatter of traders and fisherfolk, a far cry from the orderly hum of city life. And the harbor, where vibrant fishing boats bobbed on the rolling waves, was a novel sight compared to the sleek airships that crisscrossed the Thranis sky. The village, cradled between the sea and the emerald embrace of the forest, seemed at first glance to be a merry hub of salt-kissed sea dogs. Yet as the sun began to set, casting long shadows across the cobblestones, an eerie quietude started to envelop the village, a silence so profound it made the city's constant noise seem like a distant memory. Into this world of contrasting tranquility and silent dread, Alara stepped in as a reluctant heiress. She had left behind the vibrant city life of Thranis and her monotonous duties as a scribe. Alara was an outsider, her heart a cocktail of skepticism, curiosity, and a longing for solitude and inspiration. She sought solace in the cadence of the crashing waves, the wind that carried tales of far-off lands, and the village with its peculiar traditions. She had traded the parchment's musty scent and the city's rhythmic chaos for the salty sea breeze and eerie calm. It was a trade-off that she hoped would untether the bound stories within her. Now, she found herself in the quaint seaside cottage that her late aunt had bequeathed to her. This serene but unsettling new environment was her only inheritance. Like its previous inhabitant, the cottage exuded an air of mystery. Overgrown with ivy and nestled on the edge of the village, it overlooked the sprawling, restless sea. Inside was an eclectic collection of seashells, artifacts, and scrolls from her aunt's life. Alara's first few days in Sieglint were a whirlwind of adjustment. The friendliness of the villagers, the clean air, the feel of sand and dirt underfoot. It was all so different from the city life she was used to. Yet, she found herself warming to the peculiarities of the village. But one thing stood out the villagers' fear of the sea at night. Even Moira, her late aunt's close friend, had stressed the importance of staying indoors at night, at all costs. With each dawn, Sieglint burst into life. The marketplace echoed with laughter and haggling, and children's laughter filled the cobblestone streets. But as the sun descended, the village transformed. Laughter faded, shops shuttered, and villagers retreated into their homes, leaving an eerie silence in their wake. This unyielding rule piqued Alara's curiosity and set her on a path to uncover the truth. Driven by curiosity and a dash of city-born defiance, Alara decided to challenge the village's unspoken curfew. One evening, as the sun began its descent, she ventured to the beach. The familiar hum of city life felt a world away as she stepped onto the cool sand the silence of the village pressing in around her. Her heart thrummed in her chest, a mix of anticipation and unease. She was breaking the rules, stepping into the unknown, and it was both thrilling and terrifying. The distant sounds of the village preparing for night echoed in her ears, a stark reminder of the eerie transformation that was about to unfold. Upon reaching the deserted shoreline, she found a spot amidst the cool sand. A deep scarlet sunset stained the sky the dying embers of daylight reflecting off the receding tide. As the sun sunk further, a chill swept in with the breeze. Alara pulled her shawl tighter, her gaze fixed on the darkening horizon. Slowly the glinting sea transformed, its tranquil surface marred by strange, subtle disturbances. Unnatural shapes broke the water's surface, elongated and sinuous, wavering under the dim twilight. The shapes were dark and elusive, their silhouettes contrasting against the sea's shimmering fabric. They rose, danced, and submerged, their movements eerily synchronized, almost choreographed. A haunting melody, a song of the deep, seemed to permeate the air, adding to the surreal spectacle. Alara felt a shiver snake down her spine, her heart thudding against her ribs. She backed away, the eerie spectacle instilling a gnawing dread. Her footsteps quickened as she retreated toward the village, the chilling sight branded into her mind. 
The following day, Alara perused the market and happened upon a friendly face. Cyrus, a local fisherman who Alara found to have a warm, jovial demeanor. Beyond the mere pleasantries, Alara mentioned in passing, seeing strange shapes in the water from her window. She knew of her mistake the moment she saw his face. The friendly smile faded, replaced by a look of shock and worry. Strange shapes? He whispered. We don't... We don't talk about such things here, Alara. You'd do well to remember that. Cyrus held her gaze, and a sense of chill ran through her. She nodded, swallowing hard. I... I understand. That night, Moira visited Alara, her warm smile belying the tension that hung in the air. She carried a basket of freshly baked bread, the comforting aroma filling the small cottage, and a sharp knife for slicing. Alara, dear, she began, setting the basket on the table. I heard about your little... adventure on the beach. Alara shifted uncomfortably, her gaze dropping to the basket. Cyrus told you? Moira nodded, her smile never wavering. He's worried about you. We all are. Sieglint isn't like the city. There are rules here that must be followed. But why? Alara asked, her curiosity piqued. What's so dangerous about the sea at night? Moira's smile faltered for a moment, a flicker of something dark passing over her eyes. There are... Things, dear, that are best left alone. Old things. Things that the sea hides when the sun goes down. I just don't understand, Alara began, but Moira cut her off. With a swift, decisive movement, Moira slammed the knife into the wooden table, the sound echoing through the small cottage. No buts, Alara, she said, her voice sharp. Promise me you won't go near the sea at night. Alara hesitated her eyes wide as she looked from Moira to the knife embedded in the table. I, I promise. Moira's smile returned, but there was a hardness in her eyes that hadn't been there before. Good. Now let's have some of this bread, shall we? In Alara's heart, defiance stirred, a smoldering ember stubborn against the gusts of caution. She regarded their warnings as tales woven from fear and superstition. An unwavering determination took hold an urge to uncover the truth about these night sea creatures. Days later, in the soft glow of the afternoon sun, Alara made her way to the sea, curiosity stoking her resolve. There was a lull among the villagers that day, leaving the beach deserted. It was the perfect opportunity to investigate. As she walked along the water's edge, something half buried in the sand caught her eye. It was an oddly shaped stone, larger than her fist, with a smooth surface that looked purposefully carved. Intrigued, she bent down to examine it, brushing off the sand to reveal peculiar symbols etched deep into the stone. The stone appeared to be inset into some sort of buried pedestal. Fascinated by the strange stone, she tried to remove it. The stone gave free with some effort, accompanied by a grinding, sucking noise. She grimaced at the sight of a slimy substance coated the underside of the stone. With the stone free, she inspected it further. The symbols were unlike any she'd seen before. Strange, intricate, and yet they held an odd sense of familiarity. The stone was cool to the touch, its weight comfortable in her hands. As she traced the etchings with her fingers, a tingle ran up her arm. She shook off the sensation, attributing it to the chill of the sea breeze. Alara tucked the strange stone into her satchel, her mind already spinning with theories about the mysterious etchings. With a last look at the hypnotic sway of the sea and the setting sun casting long shadows across the beach, she started her return to the village. That night, Alara sat at a small wooden table in her cottage, her attention firmly on the stone she had discovered earlier. The candlelight illuminated the symbols, the shadows weaving a captivating dance. A vibration hummed beneath her skin as she touched the smooth grooves of the stone. The stone seemed to thrum in response to her touch, its cool surface pulsating with an energy she couldn't comprehend. Startled, she drew her hand back. She had not expected the stone to be anything more than a curious artifact. A distant echo resonated in her mind, an eerie melody that she hadn't noticed before. She looked around her quaint cottage, but everything was still. The only sound was the faint rustling of the trees outside and the soft crackle of the fire in her hearth. Yet, the melody persisted, 
a haunting tune that stirred a peculiar sense of melancholy within her. Her gaze drifted towards the window, beyond which lay the expansive sea, bathed in silvery moonlight. The melody, she realized, seemed to be carried on the wind from the sea, a song of the night sea. An overpowering urge took hold of her, a compelling need to understand this intricate phenomenon. Resolute, she rose from her chair, tucking the stone into her satchel. She was going to see these creatures of the night sea for herself, armed with the inexplicable connection she now had with this stone. Guided by the moon's pallid light, Elara ventured out. Her heart hammered against her ribs, yet a fierce resolve steadied her steps. Armed with a lantern, her city-made boots sinking into the cold, moon-kissed sand, she made her way towards the eerily calm sea. At the water's edge, the tide lapped lazily against her feet. Swallowing her apprehension, she peered out at the horizon. Her breath hitched as the strange forms began to surface. The light of the lantern revealed the shapes in the water, their outlines shining in the moonlight. A sinking realization swiftly overtook a moment of morbid fascination. The sea creatures were not merely shadows on the water. The light revealed details of grotesque beauty, eyes that shimmered with an unnatural glow, elongated bodies marked with patterns of iridescent scales, the terrifying magnificence of creatures that belong to the realm of nightmares. An ominous melody slowly filled the air, chilling her to the bone. It echoed the haunting song she'd heard before, amplified now, resonating with an eerie, mesmerizing power. The creatures moved toward the shore, several eyes locked on Alara. As the terror coiled tightly in her chest, Alara wheeled around, her heart pounding a wild rhythm against her ribcage. Her breath hitched, the lantern slipping from her trembling fingers and sinking into the sand, extinguishing its feeble light. Suddenly, something wrapped around her ankle, cold and unyielding. She glanced down in horror to see an elongated limb, glistening and sinuous like the creature's, holding her in an iron grip. Panic bubbled up, raw and intense, her scream piercing the night. She was yanked off her feet, pulled towards the undulating sea. Her breaths came out in ragged gasps as the icy water splashed against her, soaking her to the bone. Thrashing wildly, she fought to free herself from the monstrous grip. Tears of fear blurred her vision as the water closed over her, but adrenaline powered her struggle. With a desperate tug, she tore free, the grotesque limb retracting swiftly into the depths. Gasping, she surfaced, scrambling back towards the shore. Her lungs screamed for air as she stumbled towards the village, the haunting melody of the sea creatures echoing in her ears. The reality of Sieglint's cautionary tales sunk in with her sodden clothes. This was not superstition, but a terrifying age-old pact she had unknowingly violated. As she ran, she understood the enormity of the terror she had stirred from the depths of the sea. With the adrenaline of her flight from the beach slowly receding, Elara arrived at the doorstep of Elder Moira. The small cottage was nestled on the outskirts of Sieglint, its humble exterior concealing a world of knowledge within. Cloaked in terror, Elara pounded relentlessly against the door. Ages felt to pass with the panic creeping further into her mind. The door cracked open, bathing her in lantern light. Elara bolted inside. Elara relayed her experience in a trembling voice. Elder Moira's face grew ashen. Her gnarled hand gripped the edge of her chair tightly, a look of trepidation in her aged eyes. What did you say you found in the sand, child? Moira asked in a voice barely above a whisper. The stone, Elara replied, a strange stone with symbols etched on it. She reached into her satchel to present the stone, but her fingers met only the coarse fabric of the bag's interior. Panicked, she turned her satchel upside down, her breath hitching as nothing but a few seashells and bits of parchment fell out. The stone was gone. She frantically searched her memory, trying to recall if she'd felt its weight when she'd escaped the beach. No, she muttered under her breath, her heart pounding in her chest. I must have lost it when... when it grabbed me. A heavy silence descended upon the room. Ilara, consumed by a rising sense of dread, and Moira, confronted with a long-forgotten fear resurfacing. The consequences of Ilara's curiosity were becoming increasingly dire, and they both understood very well. Moira was the first to break the tense silence. We must try to placate the sea creatures, 
There may still be a way, she said, her voice imbued with a grim determination. But how? Alara asked. There is a ritual, passed down from the time of our forebears. It requires a personal artifact of the transgressor and a heartfelt plea for forgiveness, Moira explained, her gaze never wavering from Alara's. A personal artifact. Alara's mind raced, and her heart caught at the thought of one particular item. Nestled in a small box on her writing desk was a magical quill, a precious gift from her mother. The quill was said to be imbued with her family's essence, a connection that spanned generations. Its magical properties enabled it to never run out of ink, and it was said to bring luck and protection to its owner. I have just the thing, Alara said abruptly, rising from her seat with a newfound resolve. She met Moira's gaze, and the elder woman's stern face softened, replaced by a nod of approval. Good. Once you have it, meet me where you found the stone. Moira's voice held a trace of apprehension. A sinking feeling hit her stomach, but Alara nodded. Be quick, child. We haven't much time, Moira implored, her voice carrying a solemn note that sent a chill through Alara. Alara dashed out of the cottage. As she sprinted back towards her home, she couldn't help but feel the eerie quiet that had fallen over Sieglint. The usually cheerful chirping of the night creatures was absent, replaced by an uneasy silence that echoed her inner turmoil. She could only hope that the ritual would work, that her magical quill would be enough to make amends. Down on the beach, the sight of the shadowy shapes in the water caused her legs to seize up. It required all her strength of will to push onward. The sight of Moira standing alone, lantern in hand, like a lighthouse beacon, brought comfort to Alara. At her approach, Moira's resolute voice cut through her fear. Place the offering on the altar. Alara advanced, her fingers tightly wrapped around the box containing her magical quill. As she neared the pedestal, her eyes fell upon a new stone nestled within it. A sense of relief washed over her, the sight of the stone a beacon of familiarity in the midst of the unknown. She turned to Moira for reassurance, but the elder's face was as inscrutable as the stone itself. Upon a second glance, Alara realized the stone was not just new, but freshly placed. As she began to kneel, intending to set the box atop the pedestal, her eyes caught a chilling detail. Splattered around the new stone was a slimy substance, glinting ominously in the lantern's flickering light. It was old ichor, dried blood. The sight was a silent scream of danger, a warning that sent a shiver of dread coursing through her veins. A sense of foreboding unfurled within her, coiling tightly in the pit of her stomach. She swallowed hard, pushing the fear down into the depths. Now was not the time for fear, she told herself, even as every instinct screamed otherwise. We must begin the incantation, Moira interrupted, her voice cutting through the icy winds. Alara took a moment, standing before the pedestal. The air was heavy with the weight of their task, a tangible pressure that seemed to push down on her shoulders. She could feel the enormity of what they were about to do the importance of their mission to restore balance to Sieglint. She took a deep breath, steeling herself. The sea of shadows stretched out before them, a dark and undulating mirror of their fear. Inside her, terror clawed at the walls of her courage, desperate to break free. But she held it back, kept it at bay. It was time to make amends. The chant began, Moira's voice rising and falling in the still night air. The words were in an ancient language, one forgotten by time and remembered only by the sea and the stones. It resonated with an energy that sent a prickling sensation up Alara's spine, like the touch of a ghost. Alara echoed Moira, her voice joining in the strange, haunting melody. Each syllable fell in rhythm with the slow, pulsating hum of the sea, a song that seemed to come from the very heart of the night itself. The world around them seemed to hold its breath, waiting watching as they prepared to make their stand. The finality of the last verse hit, and along with it, a sharp, sickening pain erupted in Alara's side. Shocked, she looked over to see a dagger buried in her flesh, a fresh rivulet of crimson spreading across her clothes. In a daze, she turned to Moira. Her vision blurred, and the elder's face morphed from one of cold resolve to one of twisted remorse. Why? Alara gasped, her voice barely a whisper. Moira's answer came out in a murmur, chilling in its calmness. 
Only the blood of a Ventaris can appease Odrin. Alara's world spun. She crumbled to the ground, a low gasp escaping her lips. Moira looked down at her, shaking her head. Such a foolish girl, she said, meddling in affairs beyond your knowledge. She knelt next to Alara, her voice soft, regretful. Poor Neris was just a sacrifice for the sea god. You, though, we brought you here. Alara's breath hitched at the revelation. Her fingers, slick with blood, reached out, fumbling blindly in the sand, trying to pull away from Moira. We needed you close, Moira continued, in case we needed another sacrifice. Still fumbling in the sand, Alara's hand hit the small box with her quill, knocking it open. As her vision swirled, her hand wrapped around the handle of the quill. With a burst of strength, she drove it into Moira's neck. Moira let out a gurgled cry, stumbling backwards as Alara pushed herself up and ran. The elder's voice followed her, filled with rage and anguish. You've doomed us, Alara Ventaris! You've doomed us all! She continued to run. The taste of fear and betrayal, bitter on her tongue, fueled her flight down the beach and away from Sieglint, away from the nightmare she had uncovered. With her strength dwindling, Alara risked a glance back. The sight that met her eyes was one of sheer horror. Dark, sinewy figures lumbered up the beach, their monstrous forms a stark contrast against the moonlit shoreline. A shudder of pure terror coursed through Alara's body, propelling her further. Her breath came in ragged gasps, her heart pounding wildly against her ribs. Behind her, the distant screams and pleas of the villagers rose, a chilling symphony of fear and dread. Her lungs burned, her legs screamed, her side wet with blood, and then her world went black. Her legs buckled beneath her, and she crashed into the cold, wet sand. As the chilling darkness claimed her consciousness, the last thing she heard was the wind as it carried the echoes of Sieglint's death throes. A haunting lullaby would forever be etched into her soul. Elara awoke. A dull throbbing pulsed from her side, and a strange swaying sensation enveloped her. The dimly lit cabin swam into focus as her eyes adjusted, revealing timber beams overhead and worn wooden walls. A ship. Moving gingerly, she brought her hand to her side, flinching at the contact. Her fingers traced over coarse fabric bandages, wrapped tightly around her middle, their presence a stark reminder of her ordeal. A tender hiss escaped her lips as she shifted, propping herself up. The reality of her survival was tangible, present in the stiff fabric of the bandages and the gentle rocking of the ship. Alara's memory faded into focus. An icy dread crept into her heart. She remembered the sight of the monstrous creatures and the haunting screams of her doomed village. A sense of loss washed over her. A figure loomed in her periphery, making their way towards her. A woman, weathered and wise, with hands that had seen much work and even more care. Her kind eyes met Alara's, and she gently urged her to stay down. You're lucky to be alive, miss. Found you washed up on the shore, bloodied and unconscious, she remarked dabbing a wet cloth against Alara's fevered forehead. Alara licked her dry lips, her voice raspy as she asked, Sieglint, what happened to Sieglint? The woman paused, her brow furrowing. Sieglint? I'm sorry, dear, but there's no place by that name around here. Alara stared at her, a chill running down her spine. But it's a village on the coast. I've been living there for weeks. The woman shook her head her expression filled with genuine confusion. I've lived in this area all my life, sailed up and down the coast more times than I can count, and I've never heard of any Sieglint. But, I'm sorry, dear, she said gently, but there's simply no place by that name. Perhaps you were mistaken, or... or maybe it was all just a bad dream. The woman pressed a comforting hand against hers, her gaze softening. Elara's world, once so firm and constant, had been pulled out from under her. As she grappled with the reality of her situation, she took a shaky breath, the weight of her survival pressing heavily against her chest. The echoes of Sieglint's death throes rang in her ears, the chilling lullaby of her village's end, reminding her of the price of ignorance and the horrific cost of knowledge.